The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. The first question, I'm going to go right to Nadia because uh, last, last week we got into a conversation about uh, diet and biomedical and all of that stuff. And Nadia says, what's the best treatment for recurrent yeast in a two-year-old? That's, yeah. a, that's a whole episode. <laughs> the whole episode really yeah. is. So, um, I, you know, we've, there's a lot that I could say about recurrent yeast. <clears throat> and um, it, is, it, it was actually one of the first things that I experienced when, before I was paying attention to biomedical issues. So back in the, gosh, 90s, I guess, one of my uh, patients, a little girl, um, had developed yeast on fungus, fungus on her nails. And uh, so I, uh, we, we got her pediatrician to, to uh, treat the fungus on her nails. <clears throat> and he actually treated it topically. And believe it or not, it changed her behavior. So that was kind of very shocking to me. And so then I met with the pediatrician and that pediatrician was uh, Michael Goldberg, if you remember in those, back in those days. And so I started talking to him about autism and he started to also pay attention and started doing a lot of other things as well. And um, sorry, Shannon, if you hear barking, it's because I think the coyotes are back. And, and oh, my no. God. Let us know if you need to do something to keep everybody okay. safe. <laughs> we'll see. I see Blaze okay. outside, so I think we're okay. okay. Um, but uh, so basically, a uh, long story short, we after that we started paying attention and realized that uh, our kids have underlying medical issues that are affecting their behavior, uh, yeast or clostridia being one of them. And uh, you know it's important to note that when you have uh, clostridia or yeast, it does actually uh, can actually cross the blood brain barrier and affect how the brain functions. So it becomes really, really important to not just obviously with that, but also because uh, yeast can cause a lot of mischief in the gastrointestinal system. And um, there's a lot of issues that, that come about from having uh, high levels of yeast. So uh, there are different ways to treat it. Uh, some people uh, do very well with diets that will uh, reduce the growth of yeast. If you think about yeast as, uh, you know, I like to uh, just anything, like you think about bread, for instance, and you leave bread outside, it will mold, right, pretty quickly. So there are certain foods that are uh, the yeast likes to grow on, like sugary foods and gluten type products and so on. And so diets are very effective. The second thing is there are uh, medications, prescription medications that are very effective. And a lot of people are, anti are taking antifungal medications like Nystatin, for instance, uh, or Diflucan. There's a lot of them. And they are extremely effective. Sometimes you have to uh, repeatedly take these medications and Yeast can overgrow again if you're not on the appropriate diet. 
And then there's also uh, less, you know, like over the counter type medications uh, that are uh, pretty helpful from what I've heard from parents as well. So there's a combination of things. I would really recommend that you consult with a physician and I would uh, probably suggest that you speak to kind of a naturopath type physician first maybe um, and they might be able to help you or a nutritionist. There are a lot of people, Julie Matthews has a lot of programs about this. Uh, I'm sure Taka has some advice on this issue. And I think that it would probably be best to start with a diet change and maybe some uh, homeopathic type interventions. And if that doesn't work, then you will end up going to uh, prescription medication. Yeah. It's if you have a child who is uh, has yeast overgrowth, and if you want to know more about it, you can just Google Candida overgrowth. I think a lot, I, you know, when my child had this, I, you know, when people were talking about yeast, and you know, and I was like, what are you talking like a yeast infection? Like, you know, this is something that women, you know, have to deal with, you know, in their lives. Uh, and I thought that's what they were talking about, and I was like, he doesn't have that equipment. I don't, what are you talking about? And, um, but it was a whole rabbit hole that we went down uh, and we made dietary changes that, that helped, but then we eventually did under the care of a doctor, um, a yeast protocol with uh, Diflucan the first time and Nystatin the second time. And I don't know what the difference between the two of them is, but I know we were, and, and there were other medications he had to take at the same time made a tremendous difference. Um, but I always like to say to people, if you are gonna start a yeast protocol, yeast is a living thing and it tries to survive and you can never eradicate yeast. We all need a certain amount of yeast in our body and in the environment. And, but when you try to you know, knock it back so that it's not in overgrowth, it will try to survive and you will get something called a yeast die off. So it will get worse before it gets better. And I know when it happened to us, somebody didn't warn us. And I was like, this is not working. We need to stop this. Things have gotten exponentially worse. And they said, no, 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 that's the die off. That means it is working. Hang in. And I remember the morning that the die off was over. And I, I thought something was wrong because my child that we called busy pants, who was constantly in motion, never sat still, was sitting still and playing with Legos. And I, I woke up my husband, I, I walked out and there he was sitting at the coffee table, putting Legos together. And I went and I woke up my husband, I said, something's wrong. And, and he came out and he was like, what? And I said, he's just sitting there. He's not running around, he's not stimming, he's not, he was just sitting there doing his Legos. And it was just eerily quiet. There were no noises because he engaged in a lot of vocal stereotypy. It was, uh, it was, there was a huge breakthrough that came with it, but I'm with Dr. Grand Pichet, a good doctor. Um, the MAPS doctors uh, are, are really good at this and, and know what they're doing. I don't think I would try this with a regular pediatrician. I don't think, I don't think that they are specialized enough to guide you through what you'll go through. Um, any, any, do you disagree with any of that, Dr. Grand Pichet? No, no. I mean, there are some pediatricians who have improved, but I agree with you because if you, uh, for, uh, a pediatrician, the likelihood is they might not know about this. Yeah. So the first thing they'll say is, no, that's ridiculous. The second, yeah. if they know about it, um, then they will just go straight to prescription medication. There which is go. fine. I mean, going to Nystatin, Nystatin is very harmless. Nystatin is a very, very low grade antifungal medication that is given, you could give Nystatin to a, a newborn. So it's, it's very harm, harmless. But once you start talking about like Nizerol and Diflucan and stuff like this, then those are things that metabolize through the liver and it would be important to keep an eye on the child every month and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not sure a pediatrician would have that level of knowledge. I do like the doctors who are much more kind of trained for autism. And so I think that's the, that's the way to go. There we go. Uh, next question. So I have a child who is 17. She has been treated by a pediatrician her whole life with not many major, major issues. She has high functioning Asperger's autism spectrum disorder. We live in Eastern Kentucky and not many specialized options. They have a psychiatrist who, um, 
has recently placed her on Depakote and she started to hear voices and is very anxious, which led to anxiety and panic attacks. Her whole life, she was on Risperidone, which has caused uh, a place on her breast. Uh, I, I guess my question is, who can I take her to now that she is 17 to help her with anxiety and help her to cope with life in general? I need a good doctor specialist in autism. Please help and thank you so much. Yeah, so I don't, if she's high functioning, both Depakote and Risperdal don't make sense. So I don't know why she's on either one of them, to be honest with you. We have to know more about that. But uh, because it's very unusual to have a diagnosis of Asperger's or PDD-NOS or, you know, like extremely high functioning individuals being on, <laughs> on uh, uh, any, either one of those medications. So I, I really think maybe you want to start looking at the same, same thing we were saying before. Essentially, uh, there are physicians who are very, very good at working with our kids, and that's because most of them have adult kids on the spectrum themselves. And they have, uh, they used to be called Dan doctors, but uh, where, where can, where, uh, now they're MAPS doctors, and, and you can look on the MAPS website, and I don't know the exact uh, uh, URL. Do you? I think it's M-A-P-P-S, but if you just Google Med MAPS with one P, it'll, it'll come up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they list, um, in, you can go by state and, and see, make sure that you read, because they have some that are certified and some that aren't, read about them. And each one of them has a different specialty. So maybe they came into being a MAPS doctor and they were a pediatrician, or maybe they, they were um, an osteopath, or maybe they were a chiropractor. They're not all equal and even. And so you have to look at what their specialty was when they came to MAPS and what kind of work they do now. But there are some amazing people in that directory. Yeah, and, and I would uh, also say that as Shannon said, there's a lot of difference between them and you might, if there are two that you can choose from, see both of them and see which one you like better and which one understands your preferences more um, because it's a, it's a, a long-term relationship and it should be someone who's willing to consult with you uh, for many years to come. I'm Googling now to see what, which, what it is, whether it's MedMaps or not. Um, I will say this, that um, it's a little bit better than it used to be. A lot of these doctors, make sure that you're talking with them about what your insurance is and if they accept your insurance, because a lot of them, your insurance won't take them or they won't take your insurance. So yeah. make sure that you're above board with everything and say, will this be covered by my insurance? Don't just assume, because that would end up in a hefty bill, because they, it is, it's not inexpensive, these doctors. Um, but they, they know more and they get together and meet at least once a year, I think it's twice a year, that they get together and share research that they have found in their practices, which yeah. is like so amazing. It's like hive mind. Yeah. It is MedMaps one uh, P M E D M A P S dot org. There we go. Um, wonderful. Thank you. You're you're much faster on the Google than I am. You're you're, you're just better at your phone than I am. Uh, I love my phone twenty four seven. Well, and that that's not the only thing you're better at than me. So there we go. Uh, so there's a long list that would take us more than today. Uh, okay, my oh, oh oh you know our dad who we talked to last week in Ireland about um, his son who wanted to ride on his shoulders uh, wrote in with a follow up. He said, "My son takes my hand and demands to go out. It's adorable but very challenging, like an extreme sport." My question is that my son is four but very strong and he doesn't ever want to wait at traffic lights. He is strong willed and I have to lift him up so that he won't be crushed in which case he is susceptible, susceptible to scratching and biting my face um, as uh, 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 my, the face off me as I shoulder ride him home. I endure this and don't react. I am grateful to get him home. Uh, and I pray to God during this process that I manage to get him home. There has to be a way to train my child to wait at a traffic light and to stop telling me where we must go. Uh, but dad is beginning to doubt that this is ever possible and he's fearful about what could happen. So 
Um, I'm sending a hug to this dad, and, and I think we can all relate to at some moment in our lives, our kids were running the show, right? <laughs> and, and, and whether it was this way or not, but when the kid is running the show and it's dangerous, I think it's extra hard on the parent. But uh, what now, because now we know this traffic issue, what would you like to say, Dr. Grantishan? Yeah, so, you know, I hesitate, honestly, Shannon, to give a, a, a like a treatment plan because um, what happens is either our kids are running the show or we enter this big phase of battle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, both are very stressful. Uh, either you give in and you're doing everything your child wants and and or you fight it and you start to actually be abused and so on and so that's why i am cautious about telling you what to do rather than first asking you is there a board certified behavior analyst in your area who can take over and guide because it's not one thing or another like for instance i could tell you uh that you should hold him you should actually practice not uh, running at a red light or um and you and you should do all of this right now when he's four and is not 14 because when he's 14 you're not going to be able to control it anymore and at four you no matter how aggressive he gets you can still hold him back um, and it's this is the time to train him that he cannot run the show. But as I just as I start to guide this dad, I worry because, as you know, Shannon, when um, when you start to intervene with one behavior, other behaviors will increase. That behavior will first increase. It's called an in extinction burst. Um, and I don't want I don't want to tell any parent to do a certain th number of things that I know are difficult, ex especially, especially if they become more severe, which an extinction burst is a period of time where, you know, let's say you start holding him from, run from uh, uh, eloping during a red light or something, and uh, he will become more aggressive before it dies down. That is a, a given fact, and that's called an extinction burst. And from the child's perspective, that's basically saying, uh, hey, you know, in the past I would get away with this. Now you're holding me back. I'm going to show you that I can still get away with this. So they're going to be stronger before they realize it's just not going to work. So I don't want to tell a parent who already sounds like they're kind of at their wit's end uh, to do a certain number of things that are going to make things harder because uh, during that short phase, when things are harder, if you give in, then things ha end up getting worse overall. Like the child learns that they need to do a massive tantrum, you know? So I, I, would I would ask this dad first to try to see if they can find a BCBA to consult with locally, uh, because it's going to be, it's going to end up being five or six different behaviors that need to be changed, not just one. Like, uh, you know, the eloping is one thing, but scratching your face is another thing. And like, there's a whole bunch of other things that you told us last week. So let us know if you have access to a BCBA who would be able to guide you. Um, the other thing I could suggest is uh, if you were to go online on our um, I guess it would be on our, on our skills website, uh, which is skillsforautism.com. There's a section called CIFA, C-I-F-A, which, which stands for the CARD Indirect Functional Assessment. And you should go in there and answer questions about these behaviors. Um, like it will very specifically, you'll say what the behavior is and it'll ask you a bunch of questions about it. And then it'll guide you to what's called a behavior intervention plan or BIP, because there's a section called the BIP builder. And that's valuable in the sense that it gives you uh, all the different things you can do when this behavior occurs. Um, that is helpful. The other thing you could do is train yourself a little bit better um, on all the techniques that help with challenging behavior. And that training you can find on the IBT website, Institute for Behavior Training. 
But all that said, it's just too complex, Shannon. And, you know, if it was an easy thing, I would guide you through it. But it, it really sounds to me like you need someone who has eyes on the situation and can guide you uh, every step of the way. Yeah. It is, it's hard because um, I know, you know, th this parent needs help. I mean, I think that that's just the easiest way to say it is this parent needs help. And there are, what I love about what you've done with your life, Dr. Grand Pichet, is that you worked really hard to give people choices about how they could get it so that even if people were in remote areas where there wasn't a, 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 a BCBA on the ground, that they could get help and support. And, and that you worked really hard. This, you know, there was a period of time when I, I came, uh, you know, because my son was being treated at CARD, and then I came to be at CARD um, and, and work with all of you because you were working at what I thought, always thought of was a good, better, best model. And, you know, the best thing is to have your, your BCBA there and to have somebody that's a team of people working with you. And, and the best of the best of that is CARD, in my opinion. Um, and that's based on me having go, gone through it and, seen, and having seen a thousand other parents go through ABA programs. Um, and I think, you know, the progress that they made with my son is nothing short of miraculous. So that's like the best of the best. And if you don't have that working with, uh, you know, a, a, even if you have to work with a BCBA, if you can get somebody to work with you remotely, that, but I, I love that Dr. Grand Pichet made sure that everybody had tools. And some of those tools are skills and the Institute for Behavioral Training that she just mentioned. Um, and everybody basically has access to that. Yes, there, there can be a cost associated with that, but it's very low cost. Um, and every week, I don't know why I didn't get one this week, but every week they send me an update about what's going on this week with skills and IBT. So let me read you last week's, um, which I think still applies. They, they are offering during COVID free trainings every week. This week, uh, they are offering parent school readiness skills from the IBT library. IBT stands for iBehavioral Training, iBehavioralTraining.com. It's the Institute for Behavioral Training, but it's iBehavioralTraining.com. Uh, they're offering that those trainings free to parents uh, for the educator community. They're offering educator useful strategies that's free at no charge, despite what it says on the thing, there's no charge. Um, they're also offering to motivated parents. If you want to take the registered behavior technician training, um, you can take the training part of it, the online part of it, um, Case by case, they will be offering scholarships to make that free for folks. And if you call them for any of these things and say that you were sent there by me, you can say Autism Live or the Shannon Friends and Family Program, whatever you choose, they will give you a 10% discount on all skills products um, right now. So the number to call for all of those things is 877-975. 4559. Again, that's 877-975-4559. But you can also go on their website. You can go to skillsforautism.com or ibehavioraltraining.com. Um, and you can message them, especially if you are out of country. And, and you know, I don't know if they have WhatsApp. So uh, that's my thing for everything now is WhatsApp. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but message them, send them an email, and they will get back to you. And if for some reason that isn't working out for you, please email me directly, and I will connect you with them. s.penrod at autism-live.com. s.penrod at autism-live.com. Yeah, uh, and I think while the stand does all of this, uh, you know, I, I, I'll try my best to try to guide through step by step and you can keep writing back to us. Like, uh, you know, what will happen if you actually stop your child from running the red, or like running at, at a red light? What will happen if you stand there with him, holding him until he calms down? And, and, and I don't know. Let's, let's try and do that and see what happens because the bottom line is getting the message through to the child that uh, it doesn't matter how long you tantrum. We're not walking until you're calm. 
But, and I also want to say, because I've been able to read all the messages from him, which I haven't read all to you, but I can forward them to you, Dr. Grampiche, that one of the things it seems like to me is there is a, a ritual that they engage in right now where the sun is like his big reinforcer for the day is going for this walk and getting to lead that around. And as far as this kiddo is concerned, is that is the great fun and joy of his life. I don't think he has any, any awareness of the fact that it's like, and I can appreciate as a parent, like it's torture for this dad. It is absolutely like the least favorite thing. It's scary, it's frightening, it's painful. He gets hurt or hit or bit or whatever. So it's the most reinforcing for the kiddo, the least, you know, it's the most punishing for the, for the dad. And, you know, but, but part of me, and please help me, you know, with this part of me is that, um, you know, it, it starts with the request to go for, it actually starts way before that, but it's this pattern. And, and there is a part of me that says, you know, doesn't that pattern need to be completely chopped back up into little things? I, I know when, um, you know, I talked about this last week when, with uh, the A word, that the little boy who wanted to go outside and they, they did the whole social story, took him outside. And the minute that he let go of mom's hand, they turned around and they came back in. Like they didn't get to the street, to the corner. It was like, the, they told him, here's what the expectation is. They walked outside. It didn't happen. They came back inside and he flipped, yeah. but they didn't, but, but he learned if I don't follow these rules, we don't go at all. Exactly. I was going to say that the best way to deal with this, and you're right that it starts a lot earlier. It starts, I think, I, I never want to, uh, I, I think our kids are just reacting so normally. I don't think there's anything about this that is unusual. Um, <clears throat> it, the only reason they're aggressing is because they can't communicate otherwise. The reason the aggression increases is because, I hate to say it, but it's because we allow it to. If it was a, another child, we would probably yell at the child or say, hey, cut that out, or no, that's not okay, or whatever it is. And when our kids are diagnosed, we tend to uh, just think, oh my gosh, like I can't reprimand my child even in any, I, I need to be so cautious because there's something very wrong here. And I don't know how to, and then we put on gloves, you know, around the child and we're walking on eggshells and the child learns that the smallest thing they do, everyone will back off. So we, in some ways, encourage that behavior. Um, so what I really would say is if this is a ritual or routine that happens, uh, let's, you know, at the minute you leave the house and you leave the house the way that you want to. Um, and the minute something happens that is a behavior, challenging behavior, and I, you know, from, from the many emails, it sounds like there's a few of them. <clears throat> you should be focusing on one at a time, really, because it'll get confusing. But whatever the behavior is when it occurs, just walk back home, like immediately go back home. And your child will very quickly, you'll be shocked how smart the, our kids are in terms of figuring out that, oh, every time I do this, we end up going back home. That's not what I want. So I better not do this. <laughs> and so you just need to do that. And then <clears throat> gradually you can shape it so that none of the challenging behaviors are occurring when you go for a walk. And, and you can make the walks longer because now it will be more pleasant for you. I, my heart hurts for this dad because I, I, listen, I remember a time when my child was two and a half and three, we started card intervention at three, but I remember how he would run for the traffic, how yeah. we couldn't, we couldn't even go for a walk outside because he wouldn't yeah. hold my hand. He, if I held his hand, he would lay down, I called it the Gandhi maneuver. He would yep. do civil disobedience. And if I let go of him for a second, he was running for the street. Yep. And I would cry and think, we're not having the experience we're supposed to have. I'm not, ex I'm not enjoying my kid the way I'm supposed to. What, what about the, like I had pictured us taking these idyllic walks through the forest where we'd pick up a leaf or an acorn and we would study it. It would be all this, one, we weren't connecting with nature or with each other. And I 
we became closed into our house because we couldn't go anywhere and I didn't know what to do. And mm -hmm. I, I believed with the, every fiber of my being that was going to be every moment of the rest of my life. Yeah. And then we started card intervention and very within two weeks of starting card intervention, we crazily took our son to a Dodger game. Like, what were we thinking? But I remember going to the Dodger game and holding on his hand for dear life and thinking he's going to run and I'm going to lose him in the crowd. And he was that much better in two weeks because he understood what the rules were. Yep. And, and so it was like that quick. But I still couldn't like be with him in public and let go of his hand. Like yeah. he, you know, we still couldn't do that. And I remember being, our community would do these big concerts in the park every summer and we would go and my husband and I would, you know, be hanging on to him. Kids would be running everywhere. And I would think, who are these parents that can just let their kids run and know that their kids are going to come back? And, and I, I saw teenagers and I, and I cried and said to my husband, is there ever going to be a time where we walk into a place and we can say a, a park or a building or whatever and say, all right, we'll catch up with you later and walk the other direction from our kid and know that we're going to see him again and he'll be alive. Is that ever going to happen for us? And I, be, I believed in even that moment and we were, we had already started intervention, but I was like, I don't know. I totally can do that now. I yeah. told, and I know that that isn't everybody's story always, but I, I just want to fill you with some hope that that is at least a possibility that yeah. this is not the rest of your life if you get the right help right now. Yeah. That's all. And, and on that note, Shannon, I think as with anything else, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the tasks that we have are long and you can't look to the future. I, I completely, I appreciate that you said this because I think for so many parents, it's, uh, it's the fear of having to deal with this for the rest of your life sure. that is, that's so discouraging, right? And it isn't the case. Like if you do nothing at all, nothing at all, things change pretty drastically after your child passes their teen years. So I would really not fear a lifelong thing happening here. The, the way to look at it is, is just today. And, and the, yes, you're right. But you're not in the woods, you know, discussing acorns and all that, but you are making a huge difference. You're just teaching your child in a different language. Look at it that way, because the language that you were using before just didn't work. And you're looking at a new language now. And uh, it is the time to do that. And for this dad, it's so early, you have a four-year-old. This is wonderful that we're talking about this when he's four, because I would have so much less to offer you if he was 14. And at four, you have a whole life ahead of you. And, 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 the other th and he's gonna change, I promise you. And, and the thing I wanna tell you the most is the kids who are very manipulative are also very smart. And that's a good thing because if he is really manipulating you right now with his behaviors, that means he's smart. That means he can learn normal uh, societal rules. He can learn those rules. So, <clears throat> you know, don't give up hope, please. Uh, this is just, uh, it's a journey and it's actually a fun journey once you get the language down. So it's all about learning the language. And honestly, that's why I suggested you look at IBT because there you learn the language of ABA. And it's, it's, uh, it's still hard to do because none of us want our kids screaming and crying for a while, but it is a lot easier once you know the techniques. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also find it ironic that a lot of times parents, we get worried about, um, and a lot of times parents will write in and ask us questions about, well, my child wants this and they want it all the time and they want it so badly and it's making me crazy. And I remember when I felt that way. Yeah. Um, but the longer you stay in ABA, then you know, okay, part of that is currency. Now that's what my child wants. So he's desperate to take the walk. And right now that's the bane of your existence. But at some point, that's gonna be the high point because he's gonna be willing to do all kinds of things to be able to go for the walk. And once you establish here are the rules on the walk and the walk only happens with those rules, 
um, then, then he'll adhere to that. But then you're going to be able to say, all right, now we're going to sit down and do math. Um, and once you do math, we're going to be able to go for a walk. It's going to be the plus in your life. That's and it so will get to, the, get to the point, Dad, where it's pleasant for you too. Um, and it has, to. it has to. That is such a good point, Shannon. I always tell our parents that the, you know, the, it is, I much, much, much prefer to work with kids who desperately want something, yeah. whatever it is, like, I don't care what it is, but wanting something is wonderful because that it tells you that that is a major reinforcer for that child. If you have a child who doesn't want anything, trust me, it's very, very difficult to motivate them. So you, this walk is a motivating factor, will allow your child to change their behavior in multiple ways in order to get to go, get this reinforcer. Absolutely. It will be good. Okay, moving on. At what age can you give meds to an autistic sensory child? My child is four and still, uh, we, and and we still won't give him anything to sleep. Melatonin makes him worse. Any ideas so I can ask his doctor? Yeah, so I don't, it, melatonin is a very good thing. Sometimes parents say that it makes things worse just because they, melatonin has a short cycle. So basically you will take the melatonin and then like four hours later, your child wakes up. That is not what you want, obviously. So uh, I think you should probably talk to your doctor about using melatonin together with Benadryl. Benadryl is also a diphenhydramine is the chemical in, in Benadryl. But Benadryl, as we all know, is something you can give to a child very, very young. Um, but, and it makes you sleepy. It's, a, it's for, uh, it's an antihistamine. So you should talk to your doctor, your pediatrician about uh, using Benadryl and melatonin to help your child sleep. I, as you know, Shannon, when I take uh, melatonin, I usually take this uh, brand called Tranquil Sleep, which uh, has uh, theanine in it and it helps you kind of last a little bit longer. It doesn't wake me up at four hours, so it's, it's pretty good. But the reason everybody talks about melatonin is because it's a natural, your body produces melatonin and it's not like you're putting in a different uh, you know, chemical into your child's body. But yeah, do talk to your pediatrician. This is a very important issue. Sleep is vital and so many of our kids do not sleep. So please talk to your pediatrician, take care of this. I promise you it's one of those things that'll make a huge drastic change in your child's behavior. Wonderful. Uh, somebody else wants to know potty training for a five-year-old with no desire to try. And they said help in all caps with an exclamation point. Yeah, so potty training is one that we've talked about a lot. It is uh, uh, very, very few children have a desire to be potty trained. So let's start there. Uh, the reason typically developing kids get potty trained is either because they want to mimic a sibling or they feel older if they do that or because it has become embarrassing now or because they want to uh, uh, please their parents and those types of things and our kids don't uh, benefit from having those social reinforcers they don't really pay attention to pleasing the parent or modeling after a sibling or those types of things but um, every child, as I was just talking about, has reinforcers. And so you have to find what is rewarding to your child. And if you can't find social reinforcers or what we call secondary reinforcers like toys or activities, then a reinforcer for everyone is food. And uh, so then you can actually use small uh, morsels of some sort of um, either candy or chips or something that your child really, really wants and loves. And then what we usually do is we follow the Fox and Azrin toilet training procedure, which is generally written for uh, two to three days. And sometimes we have to repeat it a few trials so that it works. But it is a procedure that involves 
And we've done a few shows here, so I'm just going to give a very quick summary here, but we've done a few shows on this subject and you can find it on, on Autism Lives Library. But essentially what it is, is that you will spend a couple of days in the bathroom with your child um, and you're, it is kind of a backward shaping type of procedure where you start with the child sitting on the toilet for periods of time, let's say 15 minutes, which is actually extremely long, or until they void. And when they void, they get up and they have, we throw a party and you basically will allow the child now a break and then they have to go back on. Um, and there's a prep period for this where you're giving the child a massive amount of stuff to drink. There's, you have to set up the bathroom in a way that is very rewarding. There's a lot of, as things that have to be done for this procedure to actually be effective and you only deal with uh, urination uh, you know the bowel movements come later but basically you you if you uh, follow this procedure it should work you just need to be prepared and trained and I'm I, I correct me if I'm wrong but we do have a lot of recordings on this right Shannon? We do have a lot of recordings they're kind of short I will tell you that right before the pandemic uh, we filmed the comprehensive like help for parents for potty training uh, we also filmed one for sleep and one for feeding issues and we just filmed one for compliance uh, I will say to this parent, because we haven't put it out there, we're still doing some editing and I'd love a parent's opinion. So if that parent would like to email me, s.penrod at autism-live.com, if I will trade you, if you will watch the video for me and then give me notes about how it was for you. And, you know, if you like anything that needs to be clarified, I, you know, I'll be happy to send it to you for your opinion. So, um, you know, write to me, s.penrod at autism-live.com. We are going to be sharing them relatively soon, um, but I, I would love an opinion before we do that, and I don't want you to have to wait. So how's that for a deal? Write to me. Okay. Um, I do want to address that a parent wrote in uh, about what I was saying about the hope of that someday you could let your child walk away from you, and, and they said, um, that this is, they don't have this hope. My son is 11 and I still don't have that hope. We've been doing all of the therapies since two and a half and we still can't trust that he will stay with us. And I just, I, I just want to send you some love and say to you that, yes, we started, uh, my son started therapy at three and at 11, you know, I would, I would say that, uh, you know, when he was done with therapies and I would say that that apron string was further that maybe I could have him walk five feet away from me, but I am the most paranoid parent you will ever meet. He, I wasn't at 11 saying to him, okay, I'll see you later. That wasn't, I just want to be honest with you that I was not doing that at 11. That I started because I was forced to, <laughs> people like Dr. Grampiche and uh, you know, Dr. Temple Grandin threatened me uh, <laughs> when he was like 14 and said, enough, you are, you know, he's ready now. But at 11, I, I would contend for my standards, he wasn't quite ready to be, you know, going off someplace on his own. The world is an interesting place. So I just, I just want to say to you, stick with it, uh, do what you have to do. And kids change a lot between the ages of 11 and 17. Do they not, Dr. Grampy Shang? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Kids change. But I also want to ask this parent to write in and tell us a little bit more about the therapies they've done. Okay, she does say, uh, we tell him to stop or to not do something repeatedly. He won't listen. He will do whatever he knows he should, uh, shouldn't do or not. And then um, uh, I'll, I'll wait to see if there's more. While we're waiting for that, uh, I do, we have a question about building uh, a child's desire to communicate. Uh, we have a parent, then we've had this question before about how can I increase my son with his expressive language, but re she goes on to say, but what can I do to help him to want to communicate with us? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good question. And the, the first thing that 
motivates uh, children to want to communicate is that they learn that communication meets their needs. And that's why the very first form of communication is called a mand or a request. And uh, that's because the child figures out very quickly that when I say cookie, I get cookie. And when I say out, they take me outside or whatever it is, right? And so that, that is the most important way to teach a child the value of communication. It is through manding. So I would work a lot on making sure that the child understands that when they ask for something, they get it, right? Um, that's one. The other thing is the next round of communication uh, in normal development is that you go to tacting. Tacting is when you start to point things out in the environment and label them. The reason that our kids do that, typically developing kids do that, is because they want to get the parents' attention on that thing that they saw because their reward at that time is that shared attention. So it's sort of like that's the next phase, which is paying attention when the child labels something. Um, so those are the basic formats of teaching a child or the basic uh, con concepts, I guess, um, of teaching a child uh, to, to desire communication or the value of communication. I think that's what this parent is referring to. Okay. I, I also want to say too, that I know a little bit about this kiddo who, who is so into um, space and planets and has a lot of like high interest areas. And like, just like we were talking before about when we know what the kid likes and wants, oh, yeah. um, it just makes it that much easier. If, you know, I know that sometimes it feels cruel, but I remember standing in the kitchen of a friend who had two neurotypical girls and the, and the youngest one, I was standing in her kitchen and the youngest one came in and was pointing and doing all this stuff. And the mom was standing there with a cookie and she was like, you want this? And the child was nodding and pointing and whatever. And she's like, then you got to say cookie. And she took the cookie and stuck it behind her back. And this was with a neurotypical kid. And the, the little girl danced up and down and she was like, mm, you know, and then she said, Kogi, right? Close enough approximation. The mother went there and she goes, they'll never speak if you don't make them. And, and this was a, a neurotypical, never, never. And I was there with a child with autism and I was like, what just happened? Yep. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I know that a lot of people think, well, that's cruel. Um, it isn't, it, it's not cruel because it's at two seconds and they, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm standing in line at the store and I have to ask, can I have that off the, before they're going to give it to me? There's nothing cruel about it yeah. and it's shaping behavior. And, and, and when you get into the mindset where every, you make everything that they want, like in a place where it's visible and they have to ask for it, but before they have it they quickly, eventually they learn, oh, this is so much faster than all the other ways I was asking for things. Absolutely. And, and you know, Shannon, it's interesting because this is, if you think about it, it, again, I always, you know, we always think that we're doing something very unusual with our kids because they have autism, but it isn't. This is normal, completely typical. This is what happens to all of us. Like, if from the moment you were born, someone tried to predict all your needs and just gave them to you, right? If they just spoon fed you everything before you asked for it, you would also never develop the, the ability to ask for things or language. So what happens with our kids, I believe, Shannon, is that we, uh, you know, when you're, when you have a baby, and I've said this a few times, when, when there's a baby, as parents, as moms, we have to predict what they're trying to say. We have to figure out when they cry, is it, do they need, do, what, what's my baby saying? Is he hungry? Is he wet? Do, do, is he in pain? What's going on? Does he need to sleep? And we have to figure that out without the child being able to say anything. With kids on the spectrum, what happens is at some point they get a diagnosis and we as parents think that is, uh, you know, from that moment on, we cannot treat the child normally anymore. And we, then, we continue to try to figure out their needs. Whereas with uh, any other child, when they hit one, 
what do we say? We're constantly telling our kids, use your words, use your words, use your words. And we don't do that with our kids on the spectrum because we think they can't use their words. And so the bottom line is you need to uh, make the child use their words. And uh, you can then give, and it's all about manding. Manding is very, very important, being able to establish that connection for the child that if I use my words, I get the rewards that I wanted. That's a huge, huge step. Absolutely. Uh, okay, our, our mom uh, that we asked for more information, she says that he has done card, but I don't know if it's our card because there is another card. Um, because she goes on to say that he's at Kennedy Krieger, that, which is what makes me wonder which card that he has done. But she says, card, ABA, OT, PT, speech. He's so very smart and verbal, so it's very maddening to us. She says he's been at Kennedy Krieger in Baltimore since two and a half. He goes to school with them, too. We stopped ABA in February because he wouldn't listen, so nothing else could be done. Um, so... so I just I, I wanted to say the same thing. So there is a Center for Autism and Related Disorders at Kennedy Krieger, which is not us. And I don't know exactly what they do. Um, but I promise you that if you, you know, any if you do intensive ABA, these issues just don't last. They they don't. And I even at 11. Uh, I would recommend an intensive, not intensive intensive, but I would recommend focus on these behaviors and these issues using ABA. That means using a behavior analyst who's board certified and uh, following those protocols because, uh, you know, and sometimes we can do a million different things, but they just don't get us to where we want to go. I would love to know more. The reason, and I'm not, I, I just want to make sure that the parent doesn't feel helpless, like I've tried everything that there is out there. I, I don't think you, maybe you haven't, and maybe there's still a solution, which is, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours of ABA. And can I say that at 11, you know, a lot of times parents are like in so much grief at 11 because they go, it's too late. I'm not going to be able to do everything. 11 is key. Like if you can get this is, it would be so much better to get this behavior under control now than at 14. Yeah. So I would tell you that now is white hot, like get the help and support intensively that you need. Like this, this minute, don't let anybody tell you, oh, wait, you know, he'll grow out of like, Get what you need right now. Uh, okay, I, I, we got four minutes and I got two questions I really wanna get at. Uh, how to help my son with echolalia and a lot of babbling and some of it functional but hard to understand. Thank you. So that echolalia is generally a pretty good thing. Uh, you know, it allows us to realize that the child has vocal ability. Um, it is a little bit hard to, for you as a parent to start shaping echolalia into manding, but that's essentially what you do. Your first step is to try to get the echolalia under what we call SD control or um, discriminative stimulus control, which means can, will he repeat or echo when you tell him to? So if you sit in front of him and say, say, ah, will he say, ah, say, mm, will he say, mm? So can you get him to imitate exactly what you are saying? If you can, that's a pretty good step because from there you can start shaping sounds and language, uh, actual words. Um, we generally tend to do an order, which is you know, homogenous chains. So ma, ma, which would then be ma, you know, the equivalent of ma, you, parent. Um, and then we change that into what we call heterogeneous chains, which is ma, me. And the way that you do that is through imitation, right? Paired with either an object or a picture or something like that. Um, the other way that we develop language again is manding, is those sounds that he's making right now establish a connection with his favorite objects. So like, for instance, if you can get the child to say, ooh, that could represent juice, 
right? Because it's close enough. And when he wants juice, you hold up the juice and he wants the juice, he has to say, ooh, and then you will give it to him. And you gradually shape that to become Jew and then juice and so on. And that way you're starting to shape language through mending. So the two ways that we form words are through imitation and through requests, mending. Um, it is a process. Um, it's not as easy as I just said. You would need to know some of these ABA techniques. So, you know, I, I guess, Shan, my advice would be, again, to go on IBT. We made IBT for parents who would like to train and learn some of these techniques. So ibehavioraltraining.com. And uh, there will be lessons in there, very short modules on how to uh, begin language training and how to teach language. All right, we've only got one minute left, but I can't leave this one alone. My child is 17 and the helmet he wears won't stop him from hitting himself. He'll take it off and engage in self-injurious behavior sometimes. He says his head hurts and sometimes he doesn't say anything. He can be laying down or having fun and that's when he starts or engages in uh, the self-injurious behavior. This is very serious business, self-injurious behavior. Serious business. And especially if there is no demand involved, then it is truly self-injurious behavior and it's not demand escape. So um, I, I hate to say this, but the, you have to find a helmet that he cannot remove. Um, this is very important, first of all. So you're blocking further injury to the brain. The other thing is um, you should be talking to a physician at this point to figure out what is going on. Uh, like we're talking CAT scans, MRIs at this point to find out if there is something that might be causing him pain. A lot of times our uh, kids can't tell us if there is something that's causing him pain. Um, and then I would make sure that you, the, your, the physician that you see also evaluates medications, that this is where medications like Risperdal come in actually, because there's a possibility that there could be a medication that could calm him down a little bit um, and reduce the agitation that he's feeling that, that alleviates when he hits his head. So um, I think, you know, sometimes we, are, we, we pass uh, just behavioral intervention alone. And this is very important to find out, you know, is there something structural or physiological that's causing pain? Um, while, and, and then can I medicate him somehow to help him? Or is there some other procedure that I can help remove that physiologically? And while, while you find all this out, then it becomes really important during that time to protect his brain. So you do need to find a helmet that he cannot remove. Yeah. If nothing else, reach out to your insurance today and, and tell them that you need, you need help and for them to help uh, find someone who can help you today. Uh, I'm so sorry to leave it at that. Real quickly, I know we're going over, but uh, my heart goes out to this parent and I want to say one other thing, which is, behaviorists in this case could help him uh, learn to keep his helmet on longer. That's a behavioral intervention that an ABA provider could do is just keeping the helmet on longer. Okay. All right. Uh, and, and by the way, they did say that it is not the center for, it's not our center for autism and related uh, disorders. I want to say to that mom, please feel free to email me uh, to keep the conversation going. S.Penrod at autism hyphen live. Dot com. Dr. Grampy Shea, we just love you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Always Forgive a pleasure. Uh, and I, I got to let you go. You're two minutes over. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, for all of you, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions, but we got to most of them. Thank you to Greg. We love having Dr. Grampy Shea um, on, and we often have uh, Dr. Grandin on, and we will have Dr. Grandin on again in the future. And um, Usually we have uh, Temple Grand in Tuesdays. We preempted that yesterday to feature the Ed Asner Poker Tournament, which is on Saturday. Uh, please go to uh, pokerwithed.com, I believe it is, um, to get a reminder to go on Saturday. They've got some amazing things they're gonna be auctioning and huge, huge stars. 
I'm definitely going to be there. Sending love to all of you. We'll be back tomorrow. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we haven't talked about this. Tomorrow on the show, comedian Jay Moore. We're going to take a sharp left turn uh, tomorrow. But I know we all need a laugh. Oh my goodness, we all need a laugh so bad. And he is one of the most amazing advocates for the autism community. He donates his time all the time. So he's going to join us tomorrow. He's going to bring the funny and talk about some things going on with him. I'm sure that we will all get a much needed laugh. He, he does stand up and he does impersonations. He's hilarious. So Jay Moore is on the show tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss that. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.